Welcome everyone. I wonder if I can ask, uh, I used to teach art history for many years and I want, um, if possible, I would appreciate folks turning their cameras on if they're happy. Um, I tend to find it makes for a more inclusive experience for everyone. Uh, but if you don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, I had one of the uh, more unsettling experiences of switching between teaching in a physical space to teaching um, during the pandemic online. And that really raised a lot of questions about how to make people feel engaged um, when lecturing for upwards of an hour. And I am planning on lecturing for an hour or so today. Um, so I hope people are happy with that. Um, I'll speak quite slowly, but I also plan to take questions for the last half hour um, or as long as you guys want. So, um, yeah, please um, feel free to accumulate questions and I will um, look forward to addressing them and meeting you all um, discursively at least um, after about an hour, maybe 50 minutes. I'll do my best. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm going to start if I may. Um, my name is Alex Esterick. I run a magazine called Right Click Save. Um, I just want to confirm before I start that you can all see the screen um, and that you can hear me and that you're not already asleep. Excellent. Thanks everyone. Okay, so I think I don't know what my principal role is here. I've noticed that you guys have been having talks from artists where you guys ask the questions. Um, so I suspect I'm supposed to actually come here and deliver something. So I'm going to attempt to deliver everything um, in one hour. Um, but uh, what that means is really I, I want to discuss um, the perhaps the aesthetic side of art after NFTs. Um, and also the um, iconographic side, so the side to do with meaning, um, so form and meaning. Um, and of course, you know, this isn't, you know, any conversation about art after NFTs in, in many ways is a conversation about art and technology as two previously perhaps quite separate discourses increasingly align. Of course, you know, a paintbrush is a technology and technology... I think originates from, you know, the Greek, uh, which tries to deal with the notion of, of language as a structure. So I think it's, it's probably fair to say that if you're dealing with this period right now, the age of sort of the golden age, maybe of generative art, um, you're dealing with the ascent of the coder, of the linguist, um, to the level of the traditional fine artist. And that's a fascinating moment in history. It's a, it's a really exciting time. Of course, with the NFT, we're also living at the moment um, when art became transparently financialized. Uh, historically, since you know, maybe the 17th century, the notion of art as a separate autonomous realm uh, set apart from the gritty reality of everyday life, uh, but also maybe mass popular culture um, has been very compelling and it's basically buttressed the the, the um, market for traditional fine art for 300 or so years. Um, so we have to acknowledge that what is going on around us is kind of amazing and surprising. And it's not just one of those moments where you, know, you can say this is something fundamentally different. Um, this is very different, what's going on right now. Um, on the other hand, of course, as, as I'm going to go into some detail on, uh, one of the things that the NFT also does is it it reminds us that a lot of artists who work with code, for example, um, or generative artists, co computational artists, have been working for 60 plus years uh, already. So one of the interesting things about the NFT, maybe one of the most interesting things, um, away from the market side for a moment, is the fact that it unlocks a lot of histories that were, in a sense, encrypted by you know, the traditional white Western canon. Um, so for all these reasons, I think, you know, art after NFTs is 
um, a fascinating uh, moment. From my perspective, I used to teach art history at secondary schools, um, which is a period, um, I think, in someone's life as a student, where they're really trying to kind of guzzle all the information they can. And it's not quite the same as university when you want to specialise. Um, so from my perspective, what is lovely about you know, Art After NFTs is it, it does allow one to deal in art and technology, politics, you know, society, um, and so forth, and everything together at once. Uh, the question is, can you create a compelling discourse? Can you hold together ideas um, in a way which is legible, not only to someone who is technically proficient, a coder perhaps, or an engineer, um, or a fine artist, um, but a lay person as well. And I think what we're experiencing right now is this kind of rather sort of difficult flirtation between one, on the one hand, a kind of crypto art world, Web3, um, and the contemporary art world, um, which is something else. I would just say, sort of coming to the end of my introduction, that one of the fascinating things I think, maybe the most salient thing I can say today, is the idea that we often talk about this sort of digital ecosystem as being Web3, right? And you, you occasionally hear people say, oh, I'm a Web3 artist or I'm an artist working in Web3. Um, you certainly hear artists say, oh, I don't know anything about that, right? So what's fascinating about that, from my perspective, is that uh, no one ever said, I'm a Web2 artist, you know? Okay, maybe, maybe someone might have said, oh, I'm a Tumblr artist, but... The idea that we can now acknowledge, I think, just based on the basic language that we use generally, um, that there is a kind of pr fundamental merging of the, how we say, the world of creative production, especially creative digital production, and um, I wouldn't say the tech industry, but certainly the kind of, the, maybe it is that, that, that world of... Um, tech market so i think you know oh, evelyn would you mind just muting yourself thank you um so i would say all those reasons yeah, i think it's an interesting moment and um i I'm just going to sort of introduce kind of where I come from and what I do. This is our magazine, Right Click Save. We started it 15 months ago. Um, no worries at all. Um, and the principal rationale was, from my perspective, was to create a um, critical conversation, a space for critical conversations about art after NFTs, which didn't kind of patronize either the NFT artist, the digital artist, um, the collector community on which those digital artists rely and, and, and in many respects is the collect the collective of artists themselves. And one thing we'll talk about is how, you know, in many respects, Web3 brings together the role of the artist and the role of the collector into one kind of hybrid creative entrepreneur. Um, I would even argue that that you know, it might be fair to say that to succeed as an artist in Web3, a prerequisite is that you are a collector. You collect your peers' work. You are supporting them, probably not only, you know, morally, um, but actually in, in, in practical, tangible terms. So I do think that we are dealing with a different kind of, um, yeah, digital market uh, for uh, art. Um and I think, you know, as, as uh, Kenny Schachter's new game uh, kind of bears out, there is a kind of battle for the soul of the art world going on. Um, but I think perhaps a more, dare I say, interesting way of approaching the question is, is to say that actually what we're, we're really experiencing is an expansion of uh, the domain of art. That to me seems unquestionable. And the fact that we use a word like Web3 to talk basically about the, the kind of cutting edge of artistic production, I think tells you all you need to know about this kind of interesting merging of um, art and technology. Um, and I would just say, finally, like, I'm going to go into 
discussion about sort of, shall we say, the aesthetics of crypto art and stuff like that. But I think it is just worth pointing out that um, at, at its best, I think, because of the close proximity between uh, digital art um, and technology, um, what that means in practice is that, and I've seen this and I can give examples of this, um, Dare I say good artists, or perhaps the artists who are particularly interested in playing with or critiquing technology, can often shape uh, the tech industry towards more progressive futures. It's generally the habit, not always, but it's generally the habit of artists to try and kind of work out what the problems of technology are, and therefore in the process to establish perhaps more socially progressive solutions. So I, I do very much see that close proximity between art and tech as being at its best, not always, um, at its, uh, you know, it, it can be a speculative market like any other, um, but at its best, it, it is, I think, a, a driving force uh, behind a more progressive vision of the world. One example I'll give of that um, is a wonderful artist called Stephanie Dinkins, who has been working with small data sets for many years and how um, big data uh, exploits communities of color and you know basically um, those who aren't in the majority um, all over the world and uh, or rather you know the global majority um, and what's very striking is that you know she's been working on finding ways to use small data in a progressive way for the last 10 years and you know in the last year Andrew Eng leading computer scientist says we don't need more big data we need a small data so th there is so there are some examples um of artists who are i think pushing the tech industry towards more progressive operations and of course that is i think uh, the principal guiding logic that we want to celebrate at, at right click save um not necessarily the idea of a, a new art world as another kind of insulated environment of course we in a sense and you guys if you're on the vca residency you are of course participating in in a kind of community. Um, but I, I want to try and frame this as an inclusive project, not as a kind of another elitist exclusive um, kind of tech solutionist paradigm, which I, I don't think will take us anywhere new. Um, but that's the that's that's the principle we live by anyway. So we have a podcast, right click radio, um, we do events um, Really enjoyed working with uh, Nicole and Vertical Crypto Art um, on FemGem back in December. 23 uh, female generative artists in Miami. Um, it was kind of a hectic week because I jetted off then to Shibuya in Tokyo, um, which was very extravagant in the extreme. Um, and we hosted um, these fine folk, um, which was just emerged after the lockdown in Tokyo. Um, Tokyo really only, Japan only really opened up in October of last year. So um, this was a really interesting event uh, because it kind of unlocked a load of folk who previously had only ever interacted online. And I, I, as anyone who's been aware of Bright Moments uh, last week or two weeks ago, um, you know, that, that community of Japanese, particularly generative artists, is incredibly fertile, not least because um, there's a very long history of media arts interest in Japan. And so I think what I'm trying to get at here is that, you know, there is a global um, context um, and that hopefully will become more clear. Um, but I think it's probably worth um, saying for the first time, and I will repeat this, that, um, you know, in a sense, um, crypto art is a movement for kind of global inclusivity. And one of the things that, of course, one comes across a lot in Web3 is this idea of a kind of community of outsider digital artists who, thanks to the NFT, can make careers for themselves in a way they couldn't previously, uh, when they might have had to rely on a gallery, a mediator, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, it's more complicated than that in some ways because, as capitalism always does, the 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 forms of mediation have changed, the galleries have changed form, the platforms through which we pass are, you know, and and by which we are gated in and out um, have reappeared. Uh, I suppose the question for us is, you know, what are the conditions uh, under which we can maintain a more horizontal art world, maybe a more affordable art world in which more 
digital outsiders, dare I say, can be included. Um, and uh, see, right click save is ver very much sort of um, trying to celebrate that. We, we, we don't really want to just celebrate the history of digital art, um, which is wonderful. Um, but we, we really, our primary focus is on acknowledging the community of um, you know, global, uh, globally located um, artists who haven't been able to make a living um, until the NFT. Um, we do um, collaborative exhibitions right now. Uh, the Pixel Generation is our new um, show and auction uh, at Unit London. Unit London is quite an interesting gallery, um, generally not taken very seriously by the contemporary art world. Um, but um, fun enough, is actually the only contemporary art gallery, as far as I'm concerned, which listens to the artists of Web3 on their terms and doesn't try to impose kind of traditional contemporary art or art world narratives onto Web3. And I think it is important. Obviously, I think about this all the time as an editor, um, but there is certain language that the contemporary art world is comfortable with um, and certain language um, that people in Web3 are using. And it's funny that those two don't always align. So, for example, when the Pompidou buys 17 NFTs um, or is gifted 17 NFTs, um, they're described primarily as blockchain art rather than NFTs. NFT still provokes, you know, um, resistance, even though as a technology it is it is clearly fundamental to Web3. Um, so I think what we're dealing with right now and maybe a battle that I'm trying to fight myself is this idea that really, you know, right click save is a listening exercise. It's about listening to the artists. What language are they using? What are their priorities? What are your priorities? Um, rather than saying, oh, well, this is how what's going on right now fits in relation to 90s net art or post-internet art, or uh, which, frankly, both of those movements, in a sense, were a reaction against or an attempt to canonize digital art within an art world surrounding. So I think, you know, it is important to stress that we're dealing with an expanding art world. And what I like about a show like The Pixel Generation, from my perspective, um, is it's given us a bit of latitude to include, you know, pixel artists who are basically graphic designers who weren't considered fine artists by the art world. And we've managed to kind of bring together, we've pulled together a really interesting medley of, you know, all brilliant artists, but frankly, misfits. So I think that that says kind of everything you need to know about, um, I think, what, you know, our values are. But I think the idea that we are trying to still kind of maybe ensure that the the best of crypto art the best of web3 um isn't sacrificed on the altar of the art world um and that's you know by celebrating you know for example someone like kim asendorf who invented pixel sorting um you are in invariably you're celebrating generative artists you're celebrating glitch artists who, who tend to use pixel sorting and you're celebrating pixel artists who previously didn't really weren't really acknowledged as serious artists by the um, traditional art world. So, you know, that that gesture is very right click save. Um, in, you know, it'll be interesting to see how the art world comes to acknowledge or ignores these artists, you guys. Um, but I think, you know, that that's kind of where we are and uh, we're kind of in an interesting moment. Um, trying to kind of bridge crypto and contemporary art worlds. Um, but, you know, if we're not careful, it, we are liable to use the language of the art world rather than the language of the artists who actually are participating in Web3. And I think that's a mistake. Um, and that is something that we try and guard against. Um, we try perhaps rather grandiosely at Right Click Save to... Um, a space for young scholars um, to publish their research prior to it being peer reviewed. So we have a number of kind of scholars around the world who maybe not with their primary research, but with their areas of interest, personal interest, will publish something for us, um, maybe to get ahead of the curve, maybe to publish something in a context in which it isn't going to be um, you know, uh, remain within an ivory tower, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, it, maybe that's that's kind of my fantasy. But I think it is important that because, in a way, right click save is all about celebrating outsider artists. It's important that we ensure that 
you know, the most rigorous scholarship or at least um, writing um, is what we publish. And so that's the kind of balance that we try and keep to. This is a slide I just put up um, at the beginning of any lecture, really, just to kind of um, get everybody on board. Okay, so um, I guess the principle there is really um, that digital art was the proof of concept for NFTs. Um, you know, it could have been music. Um, it could have been books, a bit like Amazon in Web 2. Um, but for whatever reason, probably because there was a kind of um, starving market for digital art, um, the NFT was kind of had a kind of um, salvific potential there. So digital art was the proof of concept for NFTs, but anyone watching will have seen the rise of blockchain poetry over the last year with artists like Sasha Styles. Um, and um, other uh, digital commodities um, being sold as or with NFTs. So if I'm, I'm talking about um, art in general, I usually try and uh, divide it into form and meaning. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of do a quick whip through aesthetics on the one hand and then um, iconography or meaning on the other hand. So hopefully at the end of this lecture, you'll feel like, you know, you've got much as you can sort of digest in one hour. But guys, as I, as I said before, if you have any um, questions, um, we'll have half an hour at the end. Anumanel suggesting that the cameras are affecting streaming. Yeah, if anyone wants to turn the cameras off to speed things up, that's fine. No worries. Okay. We've got aesthetics, um, which is dealing with sense perception, I guess you could say. Um, and we've got histories or iconography that's dealing with meaning. I'm going to start with aesthetics. So one of my, I shouldn't say this, but one of my favorite writers that we commission is Brian Fry, who's a very irreverent um, thinker, writer, lawyer, um, who's a, a big proponent of plagiarism. And I encourage you all to, to follow him on Twitter if, if, you, if you're interested in that debate around authenticity and ownership and originality. Um, and what... Um, what Brian said in his first essay for us was the following. The conventional art market works the same way as the NFT market. Sure, if you buy a painting or sculpture, you get the painting or sculpture, but that's irrelevant. The art market doesn't value the object you own. It values what the object represents. What you're really buying is an entry on the artist's catalogue resume. Thanks, Emily. Um, so... Um, I think that's that's a kind of irreverent thinking that we we wanted to start with at the outset. Um, that was from Brian's first essay for us, making sense of the forty billion dollar NFT market. That was early twenty twenty two before the the uh, crypto crash, the latest crypto winter started. Um, and I think you know that take is very very helpful um, because it I think reminds the audience that actually. Um, there's not such a big difference, really, um, if you're dealing with digital art um, to if you're dealing with um, physical artifacts, paintings on a wall. Display is still important. And ultimately, you know, the truth is, um, if you hadn't bought an authenticated Andy Warhol, you know, you hadn't bought an, a, a valuable work of art. Um, of course, one of the things the blockchain does is it brings that provenance um, it makes that provenance part of the fabric of the work. Um, you know, I think there is a question about how and whether display is essential to art after the NFT. I think it, in many respects, um, display is now in a sense secondary to the transactability of art. Um, and I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, um, art and money have always had a relationship since, you know, 
um, maybe 13th century, something like that. But certainly since the kind of birth of the kind of canon of fine art in the 18th century, um, art and money have, you know, been kind of bound together. But there has been an illusion of art as separate from money. Um, and in, in many respects, that's one of the thing, one of the reasons art remains so valuable, because it's perceived as having a, a cultural value over and above, you know, the gritty reality of um, everyday um, um, markets. Um, of course, one of the things the NFT did was to render that relationship between art and money transparent. But one of the things it did and maybe came at the cost of was display. Um, because I think it, it made uh, the transactability of art the principal logic of the art world. One of the best quotes, I think, and maybe the most important um, that I always think of um, is by a great uh, kind of conceptual digital artist called Mitchell Chan. And he said, non-fungible tokens separate an artwork's expressive or artistic form from its commodity form. And in many ways, that is, I think, one argument that supports the view that you've got display on the one hand and the commodity form, the transactability on the other hand. And I'd like to suggest one of the things we could conclude from that, um, which I think is a very, very um, uh, insightful uh, reading, is that one of the things that the NFT does is it, it kind of moves the needle away from art as a object of display to be displayed on a screen or to be displayed in real space to something that can be displayed on a phone that has a kind of liquid quality. Um, and, you know, there was a statistic, I suspect this isn't true now, but there was a statistic in 2021 that uh, the average time um, an NFT was held for by a collector was only 30 days. Now, that suggests that actually art after the NFT is liquid in a way that art, traditional fine art, um, is not, or was not. Um, so anyway, that's a, that's a kind of one thing I think that it's really worth pointing out about art after the NFT relates to that question of display. OK, so um, art and money have been or form and aesthetics um, have been um, financialized, I would say, since the 18th century. Of course, this is hyper financialized in the age of financialized capitalism. Um, but I think the NFT and, and by, um, you know, registering the ownership of uh, a collector on the blockchain transparently um, does render that relationship between art and money transparent for the first time. So what is crypto art? You know, crypto art, I, I will say, is a contested term. Um, I think it's an interesting term. It's not a term that I hear quite so much anymore. Um, I usually hear Web3 these days or generative art or digital art. Uh, and of course, the decision to choose a particular phrase or word reflects something about the ideology or the background or the interests of a particular individual. Um, but I, I am going to just give you a little bit of a, a, a kind of walk through the history of crypto art as well as the aesthetics. Um, crypto art, as defined by Jason Bailey, Art Gnome, uh, the first collector on Super Rare, um, and also the CEO of Club NFT and Right Click Save, um, disclaimer, um, regards crypto art as the movement, a global movement indeed, for radical inclusivity. Uh, indeed, he regards the NFT as the first truly global art movement, um, which I think is is um, something I would support. Um, but it does go to show that actually, you know, it is important for us to continue to support this global community um, and not let old metropolitan centres kind of return to dominance. New York, Paris, London, etc. 
Probably the case in point uh, for crypto art as a global movement for radical inclusivity is the story of Ozanachi, um, self-describes as uh, Africa's leading crypto artist from Nigeria. Um, Ozzy um, built a, a market um, having been rejected by European galleries um, because he worked with Microsoft Word. Um, anyone who's looked at Ozanachi's work will, will, I think, acknowledge that it is um, breathtaking um, and high individual and very special. Um, but it's clearly something um, that the traditional art world was not willing to accept back in 2018 or so. Um, thanks to Super Rare, um, Ozanachi was able to make a market for his art regardless. And in, in, it's very important to stress that the the um, story of Ozanachi um, is, I think, a kind of guiding sort of, um, I don't say parable, but it, it, it has a kind of intoxicating quality, this idea that thanks to the NFT um, and a kind of grassroots community of digital outsider artists, um, you don't need galleries, you don't need mediators, you don't need vertical structures, hierarchies, etc. Um, you don't need Web2, although it helps to have a following on Twitter. Um, you need basically um, the blockchain, you need Web3 um, technologies. And when I think of Web3 technologies, I think principally of NFTs, a blockchain and smart contracts. OK, so Ozan actually really important figure. Um, I think there is probably a legitimate question uh, as to whether the conditions still exist for, you know, a thousand Ozanachis. Um, but certainly I would say that right click save is, is principally dedicated to ensuring that is the future of the art world and not just um, a new generation of gatekeepers and vertical structures. Um, Jason uh, Arno um, sort of at, uh, analyzed or um, codified um, crypto art um, back in, I think, 20, early 2020, um, which was obviously just before the kind of NFT explosion the following year with the Beeple sale in March 2021. Um, for Jason, um, crypto art is digitally native geographically agnostic, democratic and permissionless, decentralized, and often anonymous. It is also memetic in that it, it kind of, in a sense, it leverages the meme um, as a simple visual device um, and commodifies that meme. Um, the fir arguably the first NFT marketplace, the, the kind of prototype NFT marketplace, is one called Rare Pepe Wallet, um, which um, I think was the marketplace that had the first $50,000 sale of an NFT. Um, but in praxis, uh, you know, Homer Pepe, which was the was the was the kind of watershed moment for for uh, NFTs before the Beeple sale, um, was really a meme with all that kind of viral kind of um, appeal um, that was sold. Um, and I think you know it, you can see crypto art very much. I think as um, a realist movement. You know, when I think of, um, you know, memes, I think in a way that they capture something fundamental and real about society that traditional art doesn't necessarily. And um, the difference pre NFT and post NFT was that we had a way of selling memes um, and so on. So I think that there is a, probably a, a, a useful kind of relationship um, to, to note down about, um, you know, in a sense, the NFT is a way of unlocking the meme economy or commodifying the meme as an art form. Um, for, for Jason, uh, crypto art is self-referential, has its own kind of internal set of values and codes. 
Of course, this code is itself um, self-referential, so it's very meta right now. Um, you have a new class of crypto patrons. Have in principle a kind of pro artist or artist first mantra, and I think this is something we definitely try and stick to at Right Click Save. You know, you, you may notice that we um, we no longer have a section called criticism, and um, because I felt that criticism. Um, by its very logic, imposes a uh, vertical structure, hierarchy and bias, frankly, um, onto the work of artists. Um, and it imposes language that artists don't necessarily use about their own work. The reason we do so many interviews and round tables at Right Click Save is not only because we want to celebrate a community, we also want to listen um, to the language that is being used and to allow shall we say, the market for digital art right now in Web3 um, to be defined by the language the artists use themselves. We believe the artist language should be the terms by which their own work is evaluated, which is why we, we kind of moved away from criticism per se, and we, 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 we go big now on our community uh, section of the website, uh, which is where you'll, you'll, list, you'll hear people like uh, Brian Fry or Charlotte Kent, who might once have been in the criticism section. Um, and finally, Dankness. Um, Jason runs a podcast called Dankness, which I'd recommend everyone um, has a listen to. Uh, because crypto art is open to everyone, judging it by traditional artistic standards kills what is great about it. Instead, it's best to judge crypto art by dankness or potency of expression and creativity. And I think the use of potency of expression there does kind of call to mind realism of the 19th century. This idea of a kind of direct appeal to um, an audience, you know, not a kind of elitist value system, but if anything, a kind of grassroots um, down to earth approach to art. Um, Back in 2021, uh, just after the Beeple sale, in fact, I, I led a, a study of um, 22,018 works on Super Rare, which is all the works on Super Rare at the time, because um, I, uh, alongside two others, um, wanted to establish the trends and priorities of crypto art, the aesthetics, if you like. Uh, so we published this text called In Search of an Aesthetics of Crypto Art um, to try and kind of bring some order. And, and and what we did was we analyzed the tags that artists used and applied to their work. Um, so because we felt like if you were if you were analyzing the language artists applied to the works they were producing, you could get a, a better insight into perhaps the aesthetic priorities. And so you can see from this slide, guys, um, futuristic retro and sci-fi themes were frequently explored and highly coveted by collectors. Um, 3D art is the most viewed with higher selling points, perhaps reflecting a medium specific to crypto art. In general, number of views highly correlates with price. The hype machine is real. And at the time, we did find that artists who had big followings on Instagram tended to sell for more on super rare. As in the traditional art world, NFTs tagged with drawings tend to sell for less, which is utterly bizarre, of course, because a digital drawing isn't the same as a physical drawing. And finally, uh, the average color palette of NFTs tends towards purple, reinforcing an aesthetics rooted in tech nostalgia. Um, I think that is something that has has only kind of hardened in my uh, my view over the last couple of years. And this pixel generation show that we've done recently, I think, does reinforce this fascination with early digital technologies. Um, I think partly because the thing about the pixel is it calls attention to the essentially artificial nature of digital culture. Uh, of course, the thing about a kind of seamless, you know, 4K screen is it really conceals the ideological kind of structure um, through which you analyze images. So I think, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about crypto art in general um, is its interest and its perhaps fascination, even fetish for um, early digital technologies from the 80s, 90s, etc. And not least, and not surprisingly, because the generation who is collecting crypto art probably grew up with, um, you know, maybe what you might call the golden age of video games. All right, so we, we did a bit of co-occurrence network analysis in this study, and we took 
a um, we analyzed different uh, tags and you can see them visualized on the left here. Um, and what you can see is, you know, some tags tend to sort of group together and and the indeed the um, Ethereum maxis and Bitcoin maxis tend to have their own um, tags, um, which you can see visible on the right. Um, at the time, there was quite a lot of tags which involved sort of Bitcoin and Ethereum law. Um, funny enough, we found that actually, you know, artists who call attention to ETH and, and Bitcoin uh, actually don't sell uh, more than anyone else. Um, so I think by 2021, we concluded that actually the hype around, you know, the, the actual blockchain as a technology had kind of died down. The most common tags were 3D abstract animation, surreal GIF and illustration. Um, the most expensive were sci-fi, space, 2D, surreal and nude. Most popular colors were red and black. Of the top 50 tags, 30 bore no relation to traditional fine art terminology, but five of the top 10 did. And um, what we inferred from that was crypto art is a hybrid of analog and digital media. So I think that's probably quite a helpful slide, folks, because what it tells us is that, you know, particularly that fourth bullet point, you know, of the top 50 tags, 30 bear nothing relation to traditional fine art terminology, but obviously 20 do. Um, and then, you know, of the top five, uh, you've got things like, you know, surreal, abstract, um, 3D, etc. So, you know, this is not necessarily the emperor's new clothes, uh, but it's certainly a hybrid um, community of artists. And that makes sense, I think, because a lot of the artists in the crypto art world probably didn't go or weren't trained by traditional fine art institutions. Um, in fact, they might be self-taught you know, in their bedrooms. Um, but ha thanks to the NFT, someone like Ozinacci, but also artists like Carlos Marcial or Sarah Zucker have made careers for themselves without needing to rely on traditional galleries. And um, so, you know, that's the trio that Jason tends to use to describe uh, crypto art, um, Ozinacci, Carlos Marcial and Sarah Zucker. But there are undeniably others. Um, and I would I would probably say that if anyone wants to go back to kind of the glory days of crypto art, uh, Mocha Collection, the, the Museum of Crypto Art, is probably your best port of call. Now this is a, this is I think a hopefully useful but also problematic slide. Um, crypto art, you know, I think there are some people who say. Um, they don't believe crypto art exists. There are people who say that crypto art should be spelt crypto art one word, um, which are the, generally the OGs in the crypto space. Um, I'm not terribly um, wedded to a particular definition. I think it is probably fair to say that, you know, the two fundamental things about crypto art are digital art and the NFT. So when we're talking about crypto, we're probably not talking about tokenizing physical objects, um, but we're also probably not talking about digital art, which isn't tokenized. So I do think, you know, I don't want to kind of be too dogmatic about it, but I think the NFT and digital art a natively digital artifact are probably the essential components of crypto art, which obviously allows for a whole swathe of different subcategories. I would also say, having said that, um, and I do think it is important to be flexible in one's definitions, particularly since we're tracking developments as they're emerging, who am I to say that this is crypto art and this is not crypto art, or this is NFT art and this is not NFT art? Um, and if, just as a little aside, NFT art is, is a term which is absolutely loathed by many. Um, but I will say this, NFT art is interesting, um, I think, as a cultural phenomenon. Because a lot of people use it. Um, and um, when NFTs emerged, I noticed, I had a friend who was a digital illustrator, who was quite a successful digital illustrator, who started calling himself an NFT artist, because clearly for him, to be an NFT artist was a way of adding value to his market. Um, and I think it is really important, you know, what, what one notices about people who don't like the notion of the NFT art or the NFT artist, is it's really a way of excluding and kind of producing an elitist discourse. 
Um, if anything, NFT art as a concept or crypto art, I do think that they're pretty much one and the same, um, is a way to actually say, you know, I'm an artist, even if you weren't considered an artist by the art world. And of course, pixel art is a good example of that. To be a pixel artist, you probably weren't trained by a fine art establishment and you probably were self-taught. Um, and you probably used, you know, Adobe Illustrator, which is clearly not the kind of primary medium for traditional fine artists. Nevertheless, uh, it is one of the principal, um, you know, digital art media today. And, you know, two of the artists, Eboy and uh, Chen, who does the Crypto Citizens for Bright Moments, both use Adobe Illustrator and they're happy to admit it. And um, so crypto art, NFT art, the language is really interesting. Um, but I would say, you know, really important not, not to be dogmatic um, because generally people who are dogmatic are trying to exclude others. Um, anyway, so I would say, you know, you'll notice um, that obviously we're talking about crypto art as a broad envelope. Um, but also generally when people talk about crypto art, they're often referring to basically um, a JPEG, which is, you know, um, tokenized on the blockchain. So maybe any work of digital art that is tokenized. That isn't a PFP, uh, an example of generative art, an example of AI or ML, um, will be classed as crypto art. It's kind of everything else. It's the other bucket. And of course, because it's miscellaneous, um, I love it even more. Um, but you can see that there are hierarchies within this kind of um, overall crypto art envelope already. Um, probably the, the most... Um, you know, uh, elitist class of works are the, the third bullet point down works which treat Web3 technologies as a medium in themselves, blockchain, NFTs and smart contracts. Um, and there are lots of really interesting artists um, who use and take the technology itself as a medium, as a kind of conceptual frame. Mitchell Chow, I would say, is one. Simon Denny, um, Sarah Friend. But, you know, there are lots of really, really good artists. Those artists in the kind of third bullet point category tend to be the ones most celebrated by the contemporary art world because um, not through any doing of the artists themselves necessarily, but because the contemporary art world likes clever art. It likes art produced by people who are intelligent um, and dare I say, probably white um, and who were trained in fine artist institutions and who understand solar wit. Um, of course, the, the principal, you know, reason that crypto art exists is to celebrate everyone else. And um, so I do think that there is it's really important to stress that there is. Yeah, there is a politics to this um, this kind of um, uh, subcategorization, which I think we do need to acknowledge. Of course, with generative art is, is particularly fascinating. We did a text um, last year, maybe the text I'm most proud of, um, called When the Artists Met the Algorist. Um, which was an interview I hosted with lots of generative artists working today and a man called Roman Voroshko, um, who is sometimes described as an algorist. And um, Roman's fascinating, very old man now, um, but I really pinned him down because I wanted to, to be able to say that all of the work that was going on, or at least the majority of it in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, was generative art. Because generative art is what we use now. It's the term that's most popular right now. Um, back then, they tended to use com computer art, computational art, um, algorithmic art. These are all very important um, terms, by the way. Um, but it's, it's important to stress that when we talk about generative art now, we are also talking about the legacy of Roman Voroshko, Vera Molnar, Manfred Moore. And, you know, I've made a big effort to ensure that, you know, as many as those artists who are still alive, we're going to cover. So we cover... Manfred, um, Vera, we've covered um, Frida Naka um, and uh, uh, Herbert V. Franke before he died sadly last year. So, you know, this is a really important, um, I think, generative art moment. But generative art has a, you know, has a very long history. Um, yeah, Emily, thanks for, for posing that little um, curveball. Um, I would say, you know, one of the most interesting texts about new media um, is... Um, one, I forget the name of the text, actually, by a, a writer called Edward Shanken. Um, and basically what Edward Shanken said was, and I, I'm, I'm actually saying that this goes up to the NFT, um, basically 30 years, contemporary art and new media art kind of self-segregated in their own corners, in their own markets. 
And new media artists would congregate every year at um, Ars Electronica in Linz or in Berlin. Um, and contemporary artists would tend to stay in the traditional art world. Um, it probably is fair to say that traditional contemporary artists regard technology more critically generally, um, whereas new media artists, I think, have tended to sort of fetishize the technology and trying to push the technology as far as it goes. And I think, you know, uh, for all the problems of contemporary art, I think I would probably historically take contemporary art over new media art only because I think contemporary art tends to kind of technologies and work out how they can be bent to more socially progressive means, uh, whereas new media has tended to kind of um, fetishize the technology itself for its own sake. And I think therein lies probably fascism um, or a, an accelerationist approach to art um, and a, a more extractive approach. And then finally, you know, I think probably the biggest market right now even is what's commonly called AI art, but what... Um, one of the uh, leading generative artists, Marcel Schwitlik, calls ML art, um, reminding us that it's really machine learning art rather than AI per se. AI is a rather rather larger envelope. Um, so um, anyway, hopefully you find this slide helpful, folks, because I think, you know, it's not always easy to track developments as they're going. It's easy to look back in hindsight. But I'm just giving you my perspective, watching the space, trying to listen as much as possible from right click saves perspective. Um, these are kind of the different trends. But as I said, you know, there is a politics there. There is a hierarchy. Um, and of course, you know, the market has its own privileges. And, and generally, I would say that right now, you know, works which treat Web3 technologies as a medium are probably no more valued by the market um, than generative art. Um, they might be more valued by the contemporary art world, um, but that's probably another question. Okay, um, I want to just, I think, give you a quick run through before I finish of some of the um, histories um, that we have been covering at Right Click Save. One moment. Okay, folks, welcome back. Okay, um, I think one of the things that, you know, the NFT or art on after the NFT has allowed um, is a load of narratives and histories to emerge um, that otherwise were largely ignored by, I think, a very, very developed contemporary art world, um, which doesn't like certain nar uh, narratives, doesn't like to admit that it is a neo-colonial project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so from my perspective, you know, Right Click Save has allowed us, I think, to uncover or at least, um, you know, hopefully guide some of these discussions towards a more progressive model of the art world. You can see that these are just some of the what I call encrypted histories or crypto histories we've covered over the last year. You know, you know, we dealt with Simon Denny and Gile Twardowski, a um, wonderful project which um, called a dot com seance, um, which um, looks back at failed web one companies through the lens of web three so i think you know that reinforces you know the tech nostalgia of web three um i think there's still a, a, an ongoing question about whether nfts will unite the art world um i think the technology is a barrier um, but for Jonas Lund, who is one of the few artists celebrated by both contemporary and crypto art worlds, and therefore, you know, really holds the keys to the kingdom, art is whatever the art world says is art, and by extension, good art is whatever the art world says is good and relevant art. 
But as the art world expands to include the vast community of previously ignored digital creators, so must the vernacular of art, or the language of art, assimilate the language of new media, says Joe Lawson Tangred. So I think, you know, the question is, you know, can you create a compelling and convincing and real art world without necessarily falling victim to those old tendencies and those old value systems? And that's clearly, the, you know, the daily problem we, we've, we try and address at the magazine. Are curators necessary in Web3? You know, one of the things that, you know, uh, was very popular was this idea at the beginning of NFTs that, you know, you didn't need galleries, you didn't need curators, you could just basically rig up a website and show some images. Of course, uh, you know, very quickly, um, people perceived a, 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 a reduction in quality uh, with that approach. Um, and so, you know, increasingly, I think maybe curation per se is is not celebrated in Web3, but certainly coordinating narratives and, and, and perhaps um, bringing together artists who, who approach, you know, similar questions um, has become, I think, a very popular strategy. Can painters succeed as NFT artists? What was interesting about Annabella here um, is that Annabella, I think, as far as I can tell, digitizes paintings um, some of the time. And she's not a self-identified generative artist. Um, but what's really interesting about her is that she participates in the generative art community on FX Hash. And um, as a result, her work has developed a market. So there is absolutely, she is a case study in a, as a painter who has made a career for herself in Web3 in a sense, by adapting to the native properties of that um, kind of gamified m market, um, engaging with her, her collectors directly, um, you know, um, probably incentivizing them on some level, supporting her fellow artists. Annabella understands how to play the game in Web3, I think perhaps probably better than other painters um, who are trying to break into this art world. It probably helps that she is um, highly literate with computer-aided design. And I think she also still works as an architect on the side, or she did. Um, so I think that kind of natively digital quality of Annabella, uh, coupled with the quality, the directness of, of her aesthetic, um, is what gives her such, an, such appeal beyond the traditional art world. So really interesting uh, case study there. Um, these titles are all the titles of articles we've published recently. Um, and I think I'm going to I'm going to end at, at, um, on the hour with this um, kind of maybe final provocation. Can we reconcile fine art and crypto art? Um, and the reason I make this juxtaposition, which I hope doesn't offend anyone, um, is because I think, you know, fundamentally, um, NFTs are or at least crypto art is a kind of realist movement. Um, if you look on the left here, folks, you'll see um, Manet's famous uh, horizontal um, format nude figure of Olympia, um, which was a direct assault on the kind of bourgeois Parisian audience, uh, a confrontation with the kind of elitist um, expectations of, you know, the white male um, spectator. And what Manet did, though, was it wasn't just the subject itself or herself um, or herself that were so uh, direct um, and uh, politicized. Actually, the way that um, Olympia's flesh was flattened out with white was circumscribed by a black outline. Um, these were not canonical approaches. These were not approaches celebrated by the Salon, the French Salon, which was really the kind of metric for success in fine art back in 1863, um, you know, what Manet was doing was saying, I can simplify this image and actually create something which is more real, which is a direct appeal um, to, you know, an everyday spectator. And I'd like to suggest that by basically um, commodifying the meme, by celebrating, you know, the viral meme um, as a visual economy in itself, um, Crypto art is very much a realist movement. You can have Homo Pepe. You can have this overt simplification of the of the of the in this case male form, um, and that be a very very valuable work of art because it somehow reveals something essential about the culture in which crypto art emerged, which was the culture of Donald Trump, which was a culture of 4chan, um, which was a culture um, which tried to weaponize, um, you know. 
Pepe, um, that little meme, as a political um, and reactionary right wing uh, gesture. Um, but the, the the fascinating thing about, and if anyone wants to read more, we've done a we did an article on a, a called a, sh a short history of Red Pepe, um, of um, that actually a crypto artists attempted to wrest control back um, of Pepe from uh, the kind of right wing um, alt right um, politicos. Uh, so it just goes to show that actually crypto art in many ways res kind of reflects the truest um, understanding of visual, digital visual culture today. Um, and as a result, I'd like to suggest, you know, talking about crypto art is very much talking about art um, and fine art and crypto art, I think, are one conversation. Um, but sometimes it takes us to look back in time to see what was once outsider art, challenging the status quo, uh, to, to realize that actually what we're looking at right now is, is I think, uh, unquestionably the avant-garde. Um, but I would just say, folks, just to conclude, um, I think whilst it is important to stress that crypto art is an avant-garde art movement, um, it is also, in a sense, a, a financial technology. And I think, it's important to conclude this conversation about art after the NFT with the statement that we are not just talking about art now. We are talking about an expanded, um, an expanding art world. Um, and that, I think, has the potential to be more affordable, more egalitarian, and yes, more democratic. Um, but it is also, at the same time, highly uh, neoliberal, highly financialized. Um, but as I said at the beginning, I think as art and finance, as art and technology become kind of um, interlocked uh, transparently, um, we are going to see the full spectrum of different political agendas um, make an appearance. Um, and I think um, what we don't need is for people to continue to perpetuate the fraud that there is basically the contemporary art world, which is the real art world, and the crypto art world, which should just shut up and, and, and listen. Um, the reality is we're dealing now in an age of art and technology um, coming together. And I think the NFT is a really interesting kind of um, instantiation. Of that. So thanks for listening. Sorry I went a bit long, um, but hopefully you found that interesting. And uh, yeah, happy to take questions. So if you want to ask a question, um, you type in the chat. I would personally love it if you have asked a question, if you make an appearance, but I understand if um, that doesn't work for connection reasons. Uh, Emily, um, has a study of crypto art aesthetics been done since 2021? Would be interesting to see how that data has evolved. Um, yes. Uh, I agree with you. Um, we do have uh, one writer who, who writes for Reclick Save called Kyle Waters, who you may have noticed was part of that original study. He often writes about the data surrounding um, crypto art and has done since 2021. So um, if anyone's interested in, in how the data has evolved over time, uh, I very much recommend um, Kyle Waters, um, who uh, also works for a platform called um, Coinmetrics. So he's a data analyst. Um, and we're lucky to have him writing for us. So, Emily, that's my answer. Sun grazers. Yes, you may ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, apologies that we have no camera. It's four o'clock in the morning here in Australia, and honestly, we're not looking at our best. <laughs> so, um, but I wanted to ask you, um, you, you've made an interesting um, statement that um, display is secondary to transactability, and I understand where that comes from, but I would argue a couple of things. Um, one is that um, 
you know, in our in our home now. If you walk into somebody's home, you you, you make a judgment on on their taste by what they've got on the wall. Um, <clears throat> in our home now, we have three screens, and if you come round for a beer at, at our gaff, then um, you you will see not let's say five pieces of art hanging on the wall you will over the course of the evening see you know maybe a hundred that gradually cycle through and i would argue that um that the, the nft world has brought with it a um uh, a way of displaying that hasn't really been there before because uh, you're not just looking at JPEGs, you are looking at a representation of an NFT that has value. Um, and, the, and the second part of that is that um, uh, Web3 comes with the metaverse and we have hugely enjoyed um, hanging uh, the art that we've created into our own metaverse and we're, and we're just in the process of talking about hanging what we have collected into the metaverse because in the same way it's a statement of who you are and your taste and all of the rest of it so <clears throat> I, I would just say that i, I think it, it, it yes transactability is the um is the thing that one notices most but actually a whole bunch of display options have come too um <clears throat> that means that things like generative art can happen and uh you know 3d that moves and and, and those kind of things i'm interested in your thoughts on that yeah, no, I'm really reassured and, and gratified to hear that you do display digital art on screens. I think it takes quite a commitment and a love of digital art to do so. I think I was making probably a, a, a rather less interesting point, um, which was that in practice, if you're buying an NFT, you're buying the certificate of authenticity on the blockchain first and foremost. Um, and um, probably, you know, 90% of NFTs the actual digital asset associated with the NFT is off chain and probably because it's too large and the blockchain is not very good at storing digital files really of any size, um, which is, of course, one of the principal reasons that this kind of on chain generative art, um, art blocks, FX hash, etc., has become so popular is principally um, the, the, uh, the seed phrase or the hash um, is all you need to generate that um, set of outputs. So I think, yeah, there's a kind of technical point where, you know, I think the reality of, you know, digital art relying on the NFT as a, as a kind of means of commodifying itself. What that means in practice is not saying that the display of digital art is, is secondary necessarily, um, but I do think that it is no longer the essential component of that digital object in a sense. Um, I do think that being said, clearly, you only have to look at the kind of broad spectrum of, in, of generative art uh, that's emerged in, in, in the last couple of years to see that um, really a lot of generative artists want visual seduction. They want to embrace, you know, almost kind of modernist, you know, color harmonies and balances and complexity and and of course emergent possibility that that comes when you deal with um uh, autonomous uh, systems uh, but i think yeah display and the visual itself is clearly um uh, fundamental to the market for digital art and the experience of digital art um but i do think you know as far as the nft is concerned um for me the nft continues the de dematerialization of the art object um, that you can see starting with perhaps, you know, conceptualism in the 1960s and so on. So, yeah, I think maybe my point is a bit technical. Um, visual, you know, display is, is very important. I'm personally reassured that you, you are committed to that. Um, but I think, yeah, it's something to watch anyway. Um, I hope that was a satisfying answer. Um, uh, no, Google, no. you have... Fascinating perspective. Thank you very much indeed. I'll, I'll, I'll cede to Numenor because uh, she always has interesting questions. Thanks a lot. Let's see if my uh, camera. Hi. <laughs> I'll turn my camera on. Um, <clears throat> nice to see you. Thank you so much for this. I feel like there's 50 questions inside of me that will come out at some point and I will write them down and maybe ask you. Um, but I think the last slide that you showed with the Manet and the rare Pepe wallet, uh, Homer Pepe is one of the most 
beautiful things I've seen in a uh, slide in this residency so far. And I love that you described crypto art as a realist movement. I think that's so rich. And the thing that I was thinking about from my personal practice perspective, I'm a digital abstract artist. I have a traditional painting background, but I find that when I'm in procreate or rebel, um, I'm using, I am actually creating realist art because I'm creating something that looks like a drip that's not a drip. And I was wondering if there's any, if there's been any discussion on RCA around the discussion of the realism of digital abstraction in re reference to the tools that digital abstractors use. So I'll just put up this this little extra slide in answer to your question. I think um, it's really interesting what you say. I think what was fascinating about this, um, seeing this um, Tyler Hobbs uh, output in a physical uh, printed form. I mean, Tyler Hobbs is very uh, public about uh, the fact that as far as he's concerned, the highest resolution display is still a print. Um, that may not be the case you know, in 10 years time, um, but as far as he's concerned, it is. And I think what's really interesting, and I, I hope I'm, I'm kind of following your question appropriately, um, is that um, if you go up close and look at a Tyler Hobbs print or that one in question, um, what was very striking was the fact that there were marks that had been produced, I suppose, digitally mediated by a natively digital artist, um, abstract forms, um, which simply were not conceivable um, using traditional media, using paint. Um, but somehow that natively digital um, and also, of course, generative and emergent uh, system had managed to provoke um, a kind of uh, haptic quality um, that functioned very much as a kind of continuation of painting. And one of the striking things, I think, personally about um, not necessarily Tyler Hobbs himself, but, um, you know, generative art is in many ways, I think it is renewing painting. Um, whether painters want to admit it generally, because in this case, of course, we're dealing with a print, that's in a sense secondary. Um, we are seeing painters succeed in Web3. We are seeing generative artists printing their work in ways, you know, on a large scale, in a, you know, in a kind of London auction house, in a way which, which functions as a traditional painting. I mean, it registers as a, a you know, subject object relation, a kind of canonical experience. So um, that I don't know if that's a helpful response, but I do think that you know, we're going to we're dealing with kind of an expansion of paintings terms or, or you know, um, yeah, the, the production of physical outputs um, thanks to uh, the development of and the popularity and the market for generative art which by the way relies on the nft you know there there is another movement for for example holographic art which simply has not got a market um you know the, the simple reality is generative art like tyler hobbs without the nft would not have had a market so the nft has got to, as it were unlocked um this movement for generative art but frankly it's also unlocked the potential for a new phase of painting um, which i think is personally very interesting um, and i think you know People talk a lot about the digital, you know, the idea of a digital, natively digital object matched with a, a, a physical um, twin, if you like. And I think that 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 is uh, maybe that is the kind of discussion which is 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 the principal way of bridging contemporary and crypto art. Uh, was that helpful? That's that's really that's really helpful. And also. I would love to come up with a different word than digital because I work in digitals and it is really an awful word. And I think about another word, but I haven't been able to come up with it. So I'm, if anyone has any ideas, please, please do share. But thank you. Tyler Hobbs is a great example in relationship to, to my question in this, this whole area.
Well, that's a trillion dollar question, Emily. Um, uh, I imagine that there will be greater acceptance and I would imagine greater unity and generative artists who feel like outsiders now will be very much insiders in five years. Um, I think there is a question as to whether in order to succeed in the contemporary art world, a natively digital artist such as someone on the VCA residency would have to, as it were, play the game or repackage their work for a different collector base. Um, I do think, you know, we, we did a quite an, quite an interesting interview the other day, um, Joe Kennedy and Art Gnome um, on rebuilding the art world. Um, that was really interesting just because Joe uh, Kennedy runs this gallery, Unit London, which is generally you know, basically disregarded uh, by the contemporary art world because they started selling their artists on Instagram. Um, and now, of course, a lot of contemporary art galleries sell via Instagram. Um, and what's interesting also is that uh, Tyler Hobbs, who, you know, in a sense is a digital outsider artist who has made it inside, is selling at Unit London, um, but also selling at Pace Gallery. So we are seeing this kind of interesting and, and kind of maybe a bit dysfunctional um, flirtation going on um, but I think you know hopefully you know if if right click save has anything to say about it you know in five years time practices which were previously regarded as outside will be regarded as part of that expanded conversation um, but I certainly don't think and I, I don't like the idea that you know and it's obviously an idea that I think has a lot of sway that in order for you guys, um, in a sense, to gain legitimacy as artists, you need, in a sense, to be inside a museum. You need to be inside a blue chip gallery. Um, there surely must be a, a kind of a way of subsisting on multiple platforms with your own autonomy. Um, and I think, you know, that's that's certainly the kind of, of of model that I would hope the art world will have will have um, uh, iterated into in, in five or ten years time. Um, uh, old habits die hard. I think, you know, it, all I would say, um, I don't actually only think that the contemporary art world is under assault from the crypto art world or generative artists. I actually think that the luxury industry is looking at the contemporary art world as very much another uh, friendly market, you know, looking at LVMH buying a stake in Gagosian, you can see the luxury industry and contemporary art, you know, close bedfellows in a way I think that they have never been. Um, at the same time, you know, we're seeing a vast expansion in who is allowed, you know, into the art world, or at least to call themselves an artist, if only an NFT artist. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, there's different currents that we need to keep an eye on. Um, but certainly Hans Ulrich Obrist um, is very interested in NFTs and you know, someone like him, a figurehead like him, um, probably does have the power to persuade kind of blue chip galleries, traditional art world actors um, that they need to start listening to, to this kind of discourse that we're having together today. Any other questions, folks? Go for it, Sam Grazes. Thank you, sir. Um, uh about sort of three decades ago, maybe a bit more, we had this big argument about, you know, is photography really art? And um, we would laugh at that uh, conversation now. Um, the uh, the idea was that you just, you know, um, click and, and you've done it, um, which is different to a painting. Um, and, you know, now we can tell the difference between a fine art photography or somebody who's just, um, you know, snapped a sunset on a beach. Um, I'm, I'm interested in how you think we will look back on this time of arguing, um, you know, is pixel art really art? 
Um, do you think we'll look back and laugh and go, yes, of course it is, or, or do you think we'll look back and go, actually, it was just a fad at the time? So I, um, I would say, you know, and I think maybe before the NFT, it would, it would, it would be hard to justify um, what I'm about to say. Um, but I do think it's important to stress that um, art, if anything else, if nothing else, art is a word. And as a word, it is weaponized by, you know, different actors um, to say that this is art and this is not art. It is, in a sense, a vehicle for hierarchy. And I, I in a sense, and I'll tell you, you know, that, that appears sometimes in the NFT space. Um, I often hear this question, um, don't you just wish we could remove the word NFT and just get back to talking about art? And I hate that. Uh, because what that's really saying is that anyone who was not able to participate in the art world... Um, since the NFT uh, or without the NFT um, shouldn't be allowed in. That's the kind of ideological implication of, you know, art as a, as a gesture today. I think, you know, um, from my perspective, I just, just uh, linked you guys to a, a text we did earlier this year on photography after the NFT. Um, I do think that we are now dealing with such a kind of hybrid creator um economy that i find it very difficult to take the word art seriously um, as a kind of neutral um term and i think you know any discussion about image culture mass image culture digital culture um needs to take the word art with with a uh, needs to look at it very um critically um i i don't personally feel that an expanded art world, which acknowledges pixel art um, produced by people who work with Adobe Illustrator, is a race to the bottom. It is an acceptance of a plurality of art forms, digital, analog, hybrid, fidgetal, fidget, whatever it is, um, under a kind of expanded field. Um, I basically, what I'm trying to say is that you can have an expanded field of art without a race to the bottom, without just sheer kind of neoliberal postmodern nebulousness, flatness, where anything goes. The reality, if you listen to a community of collectors, artists in Web3, you can hear the values flowing through it. And you can see those values priced every time an NFT is sold. Um, so, you know, of course, from my perspective with right click save, it, it's it's it's. My, my kind of gamble is to say that actually this Web3 expanded art world can actually rest on more than just hype. It can rest on the language of the artists who are making the work that flows through it. Um, does that make sense? Rather than old value systems that prop up a kind of, a kind of, kind of reactionary rhetoric about art that maybe we don't need anymore and certainly isn't fit for purpose i think um and it, it isn't fit to analyze practices which um the variety of practices that we're seeing today thank you i'm processing that it's taking a while but that was a good, great <laughs> answer thank you there'll be a lot of people who would disagree with that and, and obviously a lot of people um i think one thing and one thing i perhaps should have included in the presentation but didn't have time um, you, if, if anyone's interested uh, and isn't still as, isn't asleep, um, there's I did a my last lecture for VCA was called Crypto Aesthetics, and I, I did something on um, Byzantine uh, tokens um, because um, I, what I think is interesting about Byzantine um, image culture is that you had um, images of, of of Christ and and uh, the Madonna and so on um, in uh, the religious. Uh, um, context of the church you had the very same images on the coinage um, and so you had effect effectively you had a kind of crypto art world you had this expanded art world um, which didn't privilege you know white uh, marble sculpture that didn't privilege like convincing spatial depth in a in a painting but actually privileged flatness of mosaics that privileged you know the tactility of an image on a coin um, so you had this kind, there are, um, 
there are examples throughout history of you know token economies of um, mass image cultures that are have a lot in common with this expanded field of art that I'm speaking about today. The, the frightening thing and the scary thing sometimes is having to go back to before 1200, having to go back to a pre-capitalist context to, to realize it. Um, but, um, you know, if anybody's interested in, in the idea of an era before art, um, there, there's, a, there's, a book, there's a book that was published recently called um, After Art, that, you know, contemporary art is coming to an end. Equally, there's a very famous um, uh, uh, book by uh, a writer called Hans Belting called Likeness and Presence, uh, the era of images before the era of art. Um, perhaps it's worth saying that as far as I'm concerned, in a sense, the NFT, by bringing together transparently art and technology, in a sense, ushers in an age after art, or what is commonly described as and known as art, as that kind of stable, um, insulated, hierarchical uh, realm, which in practice really and ultimately has become a kind of sclerotic, um, you know, neoliberal um, sort of knowledge regime. Um, and so, yeah, hopefully, right click save, crypto art, art after the NFT can represent some a challenge to that vertical hierarchical canon that I don't think is fit for purpose anymore. But it is a kind of mind fuck, frankly. Um, and I would understand if it, it, it doesn't register. Um, so if anyone's interested, have a look at um, my other um, video on YouTube. Uh, it's called Crypto Aesthetics, uh, but it deals with some other stuff um, because I wanted to mix it up today. Yeah, um, Ether, love your name. Um, flatness is fascinating. Um, so someone in one of our texts recently talked about algorithmic flatness, um, about the flatness of an output space. And actually, that was a, a, a recent article called The Color of Code. That was um, an interview I did with Jeff Davis. Um, if anyone's interested in, in flatness, in a in a generative art context, um, I, I recommend that uh, hugely. Um, so just a really interesting, I think, um, 